Greetings and welcome, podcast listeners. And now, if this works out, uh, video viewers or wherever this thing's going to turn up, hopefully this will be up on a YouTube page in some way. I mean, this is, I am just insanely incapable of anything technologically um, possible out, out there. See, I don't even know how to talk about it, but I am here with my friend, Banning Liebscher, for my first video based podcast. So if you are listening to the podcast and you want to see, Banning's beautiful face and my um, pottery barn ish office. Then you can go to my YouTube channel. I think I think if this works out okay, and uh, you can view this uh, podcast and and see us con uh, conversing with each other. Anyway, Banning Liebscher. If you don't know who Banning is, um, Banning is I'm I'm gonna say um, the catalyst for a massive massive global movement called uh, Jesus Culture. Um, it started, uh, as I understand it, I'm going to have Banning jump in here and rescue me here in a second. Um, it started primarily as a worship movement, um, but I think it's more than that. It's more of just like a Jesus kind of movement that has gone international. It's crazy. I mean, it's just crazy blown up. Um, probably a lot of the songs you sing on Sunday morning, if you're listening to this, come out of Jesus culture in some way. And uh, Banning was also on staff at uh, Bethel Church in Redding, California, and now he has planted uh, more recently a, a a Jesus Culture Church in Sacramento, California. So, Banning, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for being in, for being on. Well, it's great to be here. Uh, always an honor to hang out with you, and what an honor to be on your first video podcast. If it right. works, out. I mean, that's it works. <laughs> this is a historic day in Preston Sprinkle Podcast Land. Oh, so, man. I'm just honored to be a part of it. Really. So. I it's an honor for you to be uh, for me to have you on. Can, can you just clarify, expand on anything I said about the movement? I'm yeah. a, a brief snapshot to what Absolutely. I think a 20 year whirlwind uh, Absolutely. in your life. So yeah, let's. Go I don't know, I don't know how long we have on the podcast, but um, I uh, came on staff at a church called Bethel Church, uh, which some people would know in Redding, California, when I was 19. Oh, wow. And, uh, in the youth ministry, I worked in the youth ministry, and then I became the head youth pastor at 21 years old. So this is in, I'm 42, so this was 1995. I came on staff, 97, I took over as a youth pastor. When I came on, Bill Johnson had just become the pastor there, and, uh, and we just, you know, really started experiencing what was called renewal, kind of the Toronto blessing, and Brownsville was happening in Florida. And, um, and so I became the youth pastor. I was on staff there for 18 years, 12 of those in youth ministry. And Jesus culture really came out of our youth group. So we were, a, we were a youth group, hungry for revival, hungry to see God do stuff in our generation. And uh, in 1999, this why it'll come up on a 20-year anniversary next year. In 1999, we decided to put on a youth conference, and we called it Jesus culture. Just randomly, we were looking for the name of a uh, – we were wanting to name a conference, and I – there was a, there was a skater brand called counterculture and I was walking in the mall <laughs> and saw a hat that said counterculture. And I said, man, I love that concept of raising up a generation that's counterculture, but I just don't want it to be counterculture. We want it to be a Jesus culture, right. like not just counterculture for counterculture's sake. We want it to be about Jesus and a Jesus culture. So we named the conference Jesus culture, didn't think much of it. And then, uh, and then we started doing conferences every year. And the name kind of started catching on. And then a worship is really, when you say worship, almost everybody would know us for the worship, which was unintentional, was not planned. It was just, these were our youth group worship leaders, legitimately. So if you know our world at all, we've got two. There, there's, a hand, there's a bunch of worship leaders with us now, but there's two main ones, Kim Walker-Smith and Chris Kilala. Kim is 36 years old. She had just moved to Reading when she was 18. She had just gotten saved and got involved in our youth group. Chris Kilala, who's 35, was 12 when, when I started youth ministry. Really? Junior high kid. So he was in my wedding when he was 14 years old. Oh, my word. So, so he was my first ever spiritual son type deal. So anyways, these were just our youth group worship leaders. And a couple years, you know, we'd been doing conferences. And we said we were encountering God in such a profound way in worship that we said, we should record an album. Not even, again, this, we, you didn't know, we didn't even know you could do this type of stuff. iTunes wasn't around as much. YouTube didn't really exist as much. So we said, let's record an album. And we were hoping that maybe people could encounter God the same way we were encountering him in the conference. So we put an album out in 2006. 
And then in 2007, we put another one out, but we decided to do a DVD with it. Literally, one of our guys goes, let's do a DVD. I'm like, well, how do we do that? He goes, I don't know. Let's get some cameras. And we borrowed a bunch of people's cameras. But that video, Kim sang a song called How He Loves, and some kid put it up on YouTube, and it took off. Mm. It, this is before we knew viral and YouTube. It was, you know, this was like, and it took off. And so that's why our worship's so well known wow. is worship just kind of became really the, the lead for us. But our heart's always been to mobilize a generation, young for us now, it's just youth anymore, but to mobilize a generation for revival, to ignite a passion for Jesus in the hearts of people. And um, yeah, so that's what we've been going after now. And again, most people know us as worship. They don't even know, like, we call everything Jesus culture too. It's like, should we call the, the worship team Jesus culture? I wrote a book called Jesus culture. Let's call the conferences Jesus culture. And now everybody thinks I'm like the sound guy for Jesus culture. They're like, so you're with Jesus culture. What are you, the sound guy? I'm like, kids are in my youth group. <laughs> oh, man. So we, we for, uh, well, let me back up really quick. Um, so when I said it's it's more than a worship, it's it's just this whole like Jesus kind of movement. It involves youth, it involves conference, it involves, I mean, your church and and a really global worship movement. Yeah. I mean, how, how would you? What's the kind of the the quick one line kind of brand on on what you're doing or description? Is yeah, we, in one line? yeah, it's hard to capture in one line. We've now planted a local church uh, where three three and a half years ago we planted a local church in Sacramento. But our passion is honestly just to ignite, our, our heart is to ignite a passion in the hearts of believer to, believers to fall madly in love with Jesus and to go change the world. Wow. And again, we would use the word revival, that in different circles means different things. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, but just that concept of we want to see people, whether they stay, you know, uh, and the reality is 98% of the people I talk to, uh, we believe this. A hundred percent of believers are called to change the world. A hundred percent of believers are called to lead. Ninety-eight percent will do it standing behind the pulpit. So we just have a real heart to see wherever you're at. If you're in a boardroom, an operating room, a classroom, yeah. a playing field, a stay-at-home mom, and educate wherever you're at, that you would have a deep, burning passion for Jesus and a desire to change the world. So, I mean, honestly, at our core of who we are, yeah. we just want to see God move and we want to see people uh, really embrace that. That's awesome, man. So, and then you planted the church. So what's that? Well, I mean, you've been a pastor for a number of years, yeah. a youth pastor since the time you were 19. Which yeah, is, yeah. Um, what's it like now pastoring? Because you're the lead pastor, senior pastor, yep. and, and yep. now running a, a, a church along with all the Jesus culture stuff. I mean, is this... Uh, you must have a lot of really capable people around you to keep we doing do. We have, as, yeah, as you know, I mean, anything that gets done is because there's a really amazing right. quality team of people and we do, we have a great team, yeah. but we're, we're not, we're pretty big diehard local church people. That's awesome. At the end of the day, what we're doing, even nationally, mm -hmm. internationally, if it's not strengthening a local church, uh, then, you know, we don't want to do it. So, hmm. so for us, we're very big local church people. I have a huge passion for the role of the local church in the individual life of a believer and also in, um, in society and in cities and in communities. So it's been a real joy. We've had a blast doing it. Um, I, you know, for us, church community is so important to me. Mm -hmm. I really believe that, that healthy, mature believers – which I would say is the sanctification process, that our lives every day are being transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit to look more like Jesus. Mm. So that process of maturity or that process of sanctification or that process of health, mm -hmm. I really believe that healthy, mature, thriving believers are planted in three soils. They're planted in uh, the presence of God, they're planted in the Word of God, and they're planted in the family of God the community of God. And those three things really do kind of, they're not just exclusively found when you gather as a local church, but, but you know, healthy believers are found in community. Healthy believers are found in the word of God. Healthy yeah. believers are found in. So we have a real passion for that, to walk with people and disciple and grow and see them empowered as well. Like go change your city, yeah. change wherever you're at. The local church is just so at the core and center of all of that, that we just have yeah. a real passion for it. That's so great because a lot of times these kind of movements can kind of 
go beyond the church or be almost become a replacement for the church. So the fact yeah. that you're integrating the local church into this, I mean, if, for lack of a better term, it's very successful <laughs> movement in Jesus culture. That's, that's pretty, I mean, I hate to say it, that's pretty unique. And I, in mm -hmm. a, in a really amazing way, that's, that's really special. Um, so you, you came out of Bethel church, so I can't, we can't, I, I know hardly anything about Bethel. I've got friends that have uh, a good friend of mine. His son was part of the school, um, uh, the supernatural, what's it called? The, the school, school. Yeah. School, supernatural school ministry. That one. Yeah. Um, I've had some friends that have gone there and, you know, if you've been in, in, in the Christian world, especially in America, Bethel can either be like, people can be super stoked about it, or it can be a controversial uh, yep. uh, movement or whatever. So can you, can you identify what is the controversy when people are like, Oh, Bethel, like what, what is the controversy and you having been inside and on staff at Bethel for so many years, like how much of that controversy is, is legitimate? Um, yeah. Well, I, I love talking to you, Preston, cause you've never encountered controversy in your ministry. Oh, yeah. So yeah. my life's a cakewalk. Yeah. I'll have to mentor you in this. <laughs> and the little controversy it does surround me is completely accurate. hundred percent. Oh, I, always. I really always. am. A, I'm a Nazi. I, you yeah. know, <laughs> yeah, always. Well, let me give a little bit of context if I could Bethel church. Um, Boy, in, Bill came in 95. So Bill Johnson, who's the pastor there, came in 1995. And this was, in the, this was when renewal, the, what I would say is renewal. I don't know if people would know that phrase, but uh, there was uh, this kind of outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Toronto in 94 and 95, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Brownsville. This was happening, though, in different parts of the world before this, in Argentina and Brazil and different places where it's China. But but this stuff began to kind of this the God moving in this way began to break out in these places. And our pastor, Bill, um, just has a deep passion for revival. Like he has a deep, deep passion to see God move in the hearts of people and God move in cities. Mm -hmm. And so when he came, uh, he came and the church was just a good, strong, charismatic church. But he came with renewal and renewal was a little bit renewal is controversial in that there were manifestations and there was, you know, and, and again, so much of this stuff that people would have a problem with. I'm like, I was there a long time and I never saw that, never heard that. Don't know what you're talking about with that. So, so what, would be, what, would be, what would be the stuff they like? What are well, we're in the early days, mm -hmm. in the early days, there was manifestations going on. So there would be like people falling out in the spirit or people shaking or again, none of this is new. Like if you really read church history, there's yeah. a reason why Quakers are called Quakers. Yeah. Uh, Wesley's meetings were not that calm and nice. The second great awakening was, yeah, sure. I'm just saying it's not as clean as we want to make history. Right. But having said that, so a lot of this stuff is happening, like the Holy spirit touching people in some outward manifestations were happening. Well, then all of a sudden it was like, people were like, well, people are barking like dogs and they're roaring like lions. And, and there was all this stuff where you're like, oh, okay, I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> so I'm just saying like, Bill has a real heart for revival. Mm -hmm. and, and at some level, in all honesty, and this is not a negative, he just doesn't care what people think. He cares what people, he, he, people can speak into his life. But like, he just wants to please God. Like that's his main passion. So just to give some context for that, then a school of ministry starts. So then a school of ministry starts. Bethel has, I don't want to butcher numbers, but something like 2,300 students in its school right now. Wow. It gets, an, it, gets a, it gets a new 12 to 1,400 students that come in every year. So you have a lot of young, zealous, passionate students that are there. Mm-hmm. And, and, and they're going, and, and Bill is a supernatural guy. He believes in the power of God. He believes in the supernatural working of God. He believes in healing. Mm -hmm. He believes it is part of the atonement and it is available and that we're to go out. So, so, uh, in deliverance, all that type of stuff. So he, so it's a supernatural charismatic environment. And then you put all these students into it that are zealous and young. And it's a very interesting combination of what's going on. And, and Bill does not want to control things. So, so students might be out in kind of the fringe on what, like they're kind of like pressing into the supernatural in a way that's like, okay, that's weird, man. That's weird. But <laughs> Bill is not going to publicly get up and start reprimanding everybody. We pastor it one-on-one. -on -one. So I'll talk about some of that. But I just need to give some context yeah, yeah. for kind of like, and, and I would say this, much of the controversy surrounding Bethel is actually just people that have a problem with charismatics. Okay. So part of my concern is, is when I'm talking to people, 
is, is they're like going to read blogs or something. Yeah. And I'll go like, I remember, I, I don't read much of this stuff, honestly, because I've just, I, I, I'm just putting, I, I'm just trying to go do what God's telling me to do. But I remember I looked up on YouTube, uh, like we had a video that we had produced and I haven't seen it yet. They're like, oh, we put it up on YouTube. So I go and I'm watching on YouTube. And then all down the right hand side is all these other videos about Jesus culture. I'm like, what are these? And I just start clicking on them. And they're everybody that has a problem with us. Everybody has a problem with Jesus culture. But I'm like, who are these people? Yeah. Like, I don't know, like, like it's just random people yeah. who have a problem with Jesus culture. Most of them have a problem with charismatics. Okay. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Because I would say like, like our theology is a charismatic theology, right. like many other churches, right. Bethel right. would just be more visible or Bethel would have more of that supernatural happening kind of deal, which is yeah. messy. <laughs> what, what, what you said to me is so telling when you said that, uh, Bill doesn't want to control things and you have these young zealous people. And if I could hear what you're saying, sometimes young zealous people can maybe take things into a, into maybe an extreme or start to explore things yes. that you or the leadership may not be like, Oh, we, we wouldn't actually do that. But if you're not going to police everything. So I, well, from the pulpit. So we, we, we pastor it. I'll give you an example. And again, I don't know who your listeners are. So they may think like this is they're all, they're all over the map. You're going to have yeah. charismatics, non-charismatics. Yeah. Pro. Well, I'm a pretty normal guy. So, but, but we were in staff one time and these students, and I don't even know where this came from, but I was getting emails about this from my pastor friends from around the nation. So, and social media puts it all out there now, but they were like putting um, coins on the wall and the, they were stained and they're like, Oh man, this is God. This is supernatural. And, and because the coins were stained on the wall, this is literally what happened. And we're in a staff meeting going, what? That's weird. Why are you doing that? <laughs> like, you know, like somebody go pastor them and talk to them. Like, you know, students that are trying to walk through walls, oh, wow. you know, because it's in the Bible, right? So they walk right. through walls. So they're trying to go practice walking through walls. And we're all, we all are like, uh, yeah, I don't know. that's a little bit, that's a little out there, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to pay for your broken nose. After. <laughs> yeah. But the deal is, is that bill or is not going to get up from the pulpit because bill doesn't mind a little bit of mess. Okay. Bill's yeah. like it, where there's oxen, there's mess. So, you know, I'm not going to get up because he doesn't want to shut down those that are really seeking. Right. right. And those that are really trying to press in for more of God, he doesn't want to shut that stuff down by starting to get up and police everything from the pulpit. Right. The problem is, and I don't know, one of the big controversies around Bethel is what they, is this grave suckers thing. I don't even know if you've heard of this. But, I read about that. I think in a Christianity Today article. That okay, well, I'll address the Christianity Today article if you'd like. But okay, they, but so this is one of those things like, um, you know, uh, some, some students or, or in the past, like we have a real passion for history and revival history and men and women of God. So whatever it is, the Whitfields and the Wesleys and the Luthers and, you know, yeah. the, the, the booths. And then, and then for us, the John G lakes and the Catherine Kuhlman's and, huh. and, and, and so we have a, you know, we have a, we, we read that stuff. We love that. It stirs us, inspires us. And so, you know, you know, like, um, I don't know who would be a good example. I, I don't know who would have been over there. John Wesley, going to John Wesley's grave, you know, if you're over in England or Booth's grave, mm -hmm. just going and visiting it and just praying at the grave, like, Lord, what, what General Booth did in the Salvation Army, God, do it again in our day and, and let, us see, let us see a transformation happen in society like he did. Like just, you know, we'd go visit that and people might pray or whatever. Right. And then it kind of, again, these are students. <laughs> and then it kind of starts going like, all right, well, now they're laying on the grave, you know, which is kind of like that biblical thing of like, if there's yeah. an, I, I, we, I, I'm, not a, I'm, not, I'm not a proponent for it. I'm just saying like, hey, there was an anointing on Elijah, Elisha right. or Elijah. There was anointing on his grave that Elijah. made the yeah. guy come back to life. And maybe there's an anointing yeah. And then it started getting where like, I don't know, man, it was like getting, I don't know what students were doing, but, but it was weird. Yeah. But that's the stuff that all of a sudden is blown up all over the place. Yeah. And what they, and what they're wanting is for Bethel to respond to every controversy that comes up, everything that everybody has a problem with, everything that every student might do, everything that somebody mm -hmm. says. And again, I, I get me honest with you, even the Christianity Today article. Yeah. I, I I don't know if this is one you're talking about, but there's two professors that are writing a book 
on, um, on Bethel and what they say is the new apostolic reformation movement and the problem they have. And mm-hmm. so I didn't read the book, but I don't know if this article you're talking about, but Christianity Today comes out in the article and it's an interview with these two authors. And I sat there and I've been in this movement for a long time. Yeah. Love Jesus, have a yeah. deep passion for the word, right. have a deep passion for um, a, a community and people be able to speak into our lives, have a, love the body of Christ love the different expressions of the body of Christ and those who don't even agree with my theology fully. Mm-hmm. I'm reading this article and I'm like, I've been in this movement for 20 years and I don't know who you're interviewing. Really? I literally have never heard what you're talking about. Really? Wow. I've never from the pulpit once mm-hmm. heard Bill say that he is an apostle and that this is a new apostolic reformation, and that everybody else has to line up underneath us. I've never heard people, and I literally am like, I know all these people. I know, all, I don't know who you're interviewing. But wow. if you sat down with a couple of these, this is my problem, right? We go read blogs. Yeah. We go talk to disenfranchised, jaded people. Yeah. Like it, like, it, and, and then that's the kind of, it's just bad journalism at one level, to be honest with you. It's just bad journalism. But, yeah. but I'm like, listen, go talk to Bill. Right. Like I've, I'm like, I've been, I remember reading that article going, I've never even like heard what you're talking about. Wow. And I have been through every teaching yeah. and, and they want to say things like, um, you know, Bill teaches that Jesus was born again. And, and I'm like, I've been, th- I've sat for 20 years and I'm again, his teaching that he does is, is around um, the fact that, Jesus did everything fully man. So he was fully God. He didn't, he was fully God and fully man. We would have that theology, Mm -hmm. but that, but that everything he did on the earth, he he did it as a man in right relationship with the Holy spirit. So he was still God, but he didn't relate relationship because if he didn't, then we, you know, if he was, if he was an example on the earth of how we're to live. Yeah. It, 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 yeah, that, that comes straight out of a Luke Acts. Luke makes it explicit that G- Jesus did this not because he was God, but because he was relying on the Holy Spirit. Yes. I mean, so, yeah. so Bill's going after that thing because Bill's saying, listen, if Jesus is doing these miracles as God, mm-hmm. not as a man in right relationship with the Holy Spirit, then we don't have to do the miracles because we're not God. Mm-hmm. But if Jesus was doing them as a man, mm-hmm. fully surrendered and submitted to the mm-hmm. Holy Spirit, then we have a responsibility to do that as well. But then they take that thing and then they want to go off on this thing. And, and, and it's, it's crazy because I'm like, sometimes I've only been picketed one time in my life. I went to, I, pro, I spoke at a Presbyterian church, which amazing pastor, love this guy. We're great friends. And he called me and said, hey, listen, you're going to get picketed. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and I'm like, oh, but anyways, as I was driving <laughs> out, I'm famous. <laughs> yeah, as I was driving out this lady and honestly, my heart just broke for her was standing there with a sign that said, Banning doesn't believe Jesus is God. Wow. And I, and I just wanted to roll the window down and go, hey, I can, I can clear this up right now if you'd like. <laughs> like I, I can clear this up right now because I 100% believe he is. So sometimes it's that thing of like, yeah. there's just all this information going out and we're just reading sources that, and, and I, my heart is grieved because I'm watching these videos and I'm like, I don't even know who these people are or what, not credentials, but like, who sent these people? Who are the ones that are saying, hey, you know what I mean? And so we go read this stuff rather than just diving in. And I'm telling people, listen, if you want to know what Bill or like, go read a couple of the books. There's a ton of guys I've met that are like, dude, I had a real problem. And then I went and read the books and I'm like, yeah, yeah. gosh, there's nothing really I disagree with. Now, listen, yeah. I don't think everybody's going to agree with our theology. Right. One, of those, one of those things that people wouldn't agree with and, and I've got some really good pastoral friends that disagree with me on this, is, is that I believe it's God's will to heal everybody. I don't believe God uses sickness to teach us. I don't believe God uses sickness to shape us. I believe God's will to heal everyone. Now, I don't know why everybody doesn't get healed. I have questions still, but when I read scripture, I don't, I, I don't come away with another conclusion that somehow it's God's will to heal some but not others. So again, some people would say, well, I, I don't think it's God's will to heal everybody. And I'm like, I get that. These are very godly, good people right. who don't come to that conclusion flippantly. And they would disagree with them. They might disagree with how much we emphasize the need for the supernatural. 
yeah. that the gospel is not the gospel without power. I would say this. I, I, I would say that the gospel is a gospel of power. When you remove that, yeah. then, then, it, then it's not the gospel I'm reading about in scripture. Some people may disagree with me on that. It's right. fine. But so, so much of this controversy, and there is some weird stuff, honestly. I, I mean, I'm just telling you, I was there for a long time. Like, revival, though, is there. Reading scripture, this is my whole thing. I, I, Preston, I'm not even giving you a chance to interview me. I'm just on my soapbox. <laughs> this is, hopefully you can edit all this. But when you really read scripture, you know that if Ananias and Sapphira drop dead in a church today, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm, not saying, I'm not advocating for that. I'm just saying if you really read like Ananias and Sapphira drop dead in church. Yeah. Because of, and then if you read the Old Testament prophets, there's weird, like yeah, there is yeah. weird. Yeah. It's like, God, I don't quite have a box for yeah. this. Ezekiel would have been thrown in a mental hospital. I mean. <laughs> so I'm saying that I don't always think, yeah. I do think that there are things that I'm like, yeah, I agree with you. I think that's weird. I think that students getting zealous and pushing that thing too far and, 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 and I would disagree. Then there's some people I'm like, oh, we just don't have the same theology. You don't agree with charismatics. But then there is some stuff that I'm like, guys, Jesus isn't as clean as we make him. Right. When he was walking on the water, they were freaked out because they thought he was a ghost. Mm -hmm. Like Jesus doesn't always show up in the package that we like or are we comfortable. So a lot of people are like, I just feel, that makes me feel uncomfortable. And so I don't think it's Jesus. I'm like, right. listen, if your version of whether it's Jesus or not Jesus is, I just don't feel comfortable. Then you're not reading the New Testament at some level because Jesus showed up and made a lot of people uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. So that's my, I don't know if, I don't that's know if so that good. So no, I've got so many questions. I'm not going to get to them all, but so uh, I don't know if you know, but I was raised in a Mac John MacArthur environment. I went to the college, his college and the seminary. Um, and it was probably toward the end of my seminary. So, so I know yeah. that whole side very well. Now that was 20 years ago. Um, I would say toward the end of my seminary, I changed my view from cessationism to continuation. Yes. Um, so not, not through experience or nothing. I just, the biblical arguments to say that some gifts have ceased and others haven't were just terrible. They didn't follow their own exegetical stuff they were teaching us in class. I'm like, you're not following your own, like th these biblical arguments are terrible. Um, and so I would say since then, I have been a part of or at least spoken in and been involved with um, a broad range of denominations all the way from like you know yeah, anti-charismatic kind of churches yeah. all the way to very charismatic churches and i was hyper like, hyper charismatic most, hyper, yeah most <laughs> churches i've been in in my ministry now i would say the majority more than half would be charismatic churches yeah um was in one, one of my favorite experiences was over in England at a soul survivor, you know, soul survivor. Yes. Yeah. Mike Kowalachi. Absolutely. Oh, dude. So I preached at that church and, uh, and a quality, Oh, quality oh. movement and individual integrous, full of character, godly. Yeah. The character there, the way yeah. they just in my few hours, I was at the church, the way they loved on me and my family. Remember, remember my kids' names looked after us. Um, there, there was, uh, so I, I've, I've been prophesied over a ton and, and some, I, I got to admit, I mean, sometimes I'm, I'm not that impressed. It's kind of these, you know, if I get one more prophecy about a waterfall that's so spiritually, big, it's like, I don't know what to do with that. Like, I don't, um, you know, and, and, and it's always positive and it's like, well, I've got a lot of sin in my life. I like, I want you to call that out. So I'm more motivated to repent. But it, I remember in that church, there was like three or four independent prophecies over me in that Sunday morning that were all the same and they were all, they were all yeah. true. Like they all, yeah. you know, it was right when I, right before I lost my job at Eternity Bible College and started the Center for Faith, Sexuality, and Gender and all the prophecies independent where yeah. there's big changes that are going to happen in your life soon. And, and, you know, uh, this is, this is going to be good for the kingdom or something like that. And, and um, so all, all that to say, I, I, I've, I've been on the whole spectrum of, the charismatic and I've tried. So on, I would say on paper, I'm curious, like my theology would be charismatic and I travel to third world countries. And so I've experienced some, yes. some crazy stuff. Yes. And even, even non-charismatic, you're like, Oh yeah, third world. It's good. For, you know, yeah. <laughs> we're yeah. okay with that. Because, happening. because we're okay with, we're okay with a little bit of a mess over there. But I, you know, my tension, I, cause I have been turned off by the abuses and I get, you know, I, or the I, flesh. There's yeah. real, there are real, it's there. Yeah, yeah go ahead. 
And, you know, I get a lot of emails from people that were really, um, they either lost their faith or their faith was really interrupted by being in charismatic environments where, yeah. you know, they were, they were, you know, almost forced, like, you must believe in this, 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 and found yes. out, damn it. So I've seen, but it's so helpful for you to, I, I love, well, look, the Bible is weird. There's talking snakes, talking yeah. donkeys people laying on their side for over a year eating dung um there's i mean there's just a lot of really yes. ha handkerchiefs and sick. <laughs> yeah yes weird stuff so i so i it, it even in my like wow that's weird i'm like but they do have a verse to go to <laughs> but totally. it's not like they're you know i think it's weird to lay on a grave but i would have if Eli, if i was back in elisha's day i would have thought he was weird and i wouldn't know what to do yeah, with that. Totally. So i'm living in this tension of i do think there are abuses and things i'm like man yes, that just doesn't sure. seem like it's of god but at the same time reading the bible and saying if if this happened if this happened today would i be weirded out like would i be yeah. weirded out with jesus and the spirit in the bible or you know, am, am I wanting this more comfortable Jesus? And I don't, I'm just, I'm constantly wrestling, wrestling with this. So no. Um, and, and, and listen, I, 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 how would I say this? I very much, um, many people have been hurt by the excess or the abuse in the charismatic church. It grieves my heart. And, um, and, and whatever that is. And I would also say that for many people, even when it comes to what I would say, the manifestations of the Holy spirit, yeah. the manifestations of people working, there's a ton of flesh in that yeah. to say that somehow look at that going, there's, that's all God is inaccurate. But here would be my challenge to people is there's just as much flesh sitting in a church that is quiet. <laughs> we, we somehow want to equate flesh just in that weird manifestation but I'm like, we can't, we can't also then go, hey, listen, there's a, there are people sitting quiet every week in church, not, not being weird, and there's just as much flesh happening. Yeah. If, yeah. You know, and so it's that type of thing where we're like, I'm okay with this flesh that's quiet. I'm just not okay with this flesh that's loud. Well, every, I mean, you can go across the spectrum of Christianity. Of course. And, and there's always going to be abuses or younger people that take it too far. So going back to, you know, I was raised in MacArthur circles. That's it. And you want to talk about excess. I mean, the, the little mini MacArthurite seminary students that would try to preach yes. like him and act like him. And then yes. the, the reputation actually became a massive problem. The graduates of, of my seminary, there was a massive reputation of going in and splitting churches. I think we had the highest rate of <laughs> church splits because even though, even though the professors would say, look, you go into a church, don't yes. make any changes. For, they, they would literally tell me seven years. Don't change anything yes. in seven years. What they do? They go in within three months. They're they're you know changing this, changing that, doing this. You guys aren't biblical. Da da da. Then the church blows up, and and there's tons. Of, I, I've I've seen global shrapnel. I've been in Scotland. And people come up and say, "You went to Master Seminary? Can you help me understand what happened here? We had this pastor yeah. come in, yeah, we yeah, the church families yeah. were blown up, and so there's always going to be young zealous people who yes. any kind of movement in, in a in an excess direction, whether it's in a charismatic excess or a very anti-charismatic well this is what i i remember a guy saying one time he said he said most movements the rep the, the bad reputation they get or um or the way it breaks down it's not the it's not the top person or the one or top yeah. you know it's not the one or two layers it's the three four five layers underneath that begin to carry that message and it's very intriguing to me because there's a lot of movements that i'm like dude i'm a little uncomfortable what's coming out of you but then i go to the people that are actually teaching it and i'm like no, no, that sounds pretty solid. And, and in the same with our movement. So we would have a grace message. Like we have a grace message, but I'm listening to some people that might come out, those younger guys that are layers down. And I'm like, where are you getting? Like, where are you getting what you're preaching? Right. Like, I, like you can't just come and take that one thing and not have the context around it. Yeah. You can't have, you know what I'm saying? You've got to, like there's other things involved. You can't just come and cherry pick a statement you want. Yeah. And then go preach that. Like there's so much more around that. Or, or, and so it's that type of thing of like, yeah, I agree. There's a ton of people that I've heard come out of our play, out of Bethel. And I'm like, uh, I'm not sure where you're getting that or why you would be quoting Bill that way. But, you know. I, and I think that what well, you said, that could only really happen on more of a 
intimate discipleship level, even if you preach against it or whatever from the top, like that has to be, but when you have movements that kind of blow up, it's almost impossible to kind of micromanage everything on an individual level. Well, we got a lot of churches were hurt by us. And it, it, it just actually, we met with pastors. It was grieving because well, what would happen is, is we have a real heart for the body of Christ, right? And Bethel is, is a unique place. And so, you know, we don't, we don't think that other, every church should be like Bethel. You know, Bill's, Bill's doing what he's called to do, and Bethel looks like what Bethel looks like. But people would come to a conference. They'd go back to their church, and they'd go back arrogant. They'd go back to their church with this thing of like, uh, you know, Bethel's got a corner on the Holy Spirit. Our church isn't hungry for the Holy Spirit. Our church isn't going after God. Our church isn't that. And all of a sudden, these pastors, people are going to our church and coming back, and what they're experiencing is people that think are, are their church is dead and it's not hungry. I remember sending an email out to a bunch of friends up in the Pacific Northwest. I said, hey, guys, listen, I know there's been stuff. Anytime you have any questions, let me know. Or any of the pastors that want to meet, man, let's meet. One of them took us up. I don't want to name names, but he was second in charge of a movement. He said, I'd love to meet. So he came down and we met. And that was one of the things he brought up. He said, listen, it's just hard. Our people come back and they're all thinking and like we don't we're not hungry for the Holy Spirit and just to be able to sit there and go oh gosh that's so not our heart we're so sorry to hear that I don't know what to do about it at some level because it's like I don't know how to get up and then begin to go every time I don't know who these people are that are doing this hey guys don't go back to your church don't do this and now all of a sudden our meetings are turned into trying to like manage the people that are walking away that have arrogance in their heart or don't want to honor their leaders or it's just a tough one. It's a tough one to navigate. Oh, yeah. Like all of a sudden now we're just the people that are trying to manage all of the people that are, we don't even know they're doing it. Had no idea they were going back to churches yeah. and like acting like their church isn't hungry anymore. And yeah. that's not our heart. Yeah, so. totally. And that's, I can't tell you how helpful this is. Cause I, yeah, I've, I've, um, Hey, Oh, real quick. So there's been some internet glitches and just for my audience, that's my crappy internet at my house. <laughs> I've had the internet person out 15 times. They keep saying you can't get any high. It's just, it's, I, so I knew back to California. My <laughs> I know. The next I time I do this, back I, to California. Yeah, I might have to go to my buddy's office downtown. It's got a, uh, actual internet and do that so yeah. i apologize there's been a few glitches that's on my end we'll, we'll try to fix that in the future but um yeah this has been so helpful because i totally get what you're where you're coming from and so even even that point i have seen cer certain types of expressions of of charismatic christianity that equate like our brand of charismatic christianity with pursuing the holy spirit and if you don't fit into what we're doing then you're not really into the Holy Spirit. They equate, and you know what? I mean, to be, to to come to the defense of even like my MacArthur kind of background, man, they 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 prayed for healing all the time. They just didn't believe theologically that there's somebody with the gift of healing. They yeah. didn't pray for healing when when people got healed of cancer. They would say, "Praise God for that." They, I would say, they did depend on the Holy Spirit. That they, they would equate the Holy Spirit's power more to like personal morality or boldness yeah. of the gospel. But yeah. Yeah. To say they, they're not following the spirit, I'm like, man, that's just a little too strong. Like they talked about, they didn't just worship a, you know, a, a, a binary God of father and son. I mean, they, they talked about the Holy Spirit all the time. And, and um, yeah, so I, I, that's really helpful that, you know. But and to not, and listen, and, and listen, MacArthur, um, you know, at some level would definitely disagree with us on a bunch of areas, but, but, but to honor him, you know. He, 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 to honor him as a man of God, as somebody who um, has, has, has done phenomenal work in, in biblical study and theology. And, you know, it, it yeah. just, again, arrogance is in, in, in all movements, though, at some level. Yeah, so that's just totally. the arrogance yeah. that somehow comes in. It's to say, we know it, you don't. We're over here. If you don't do it this way or we, whatever, you know. And I just like, just need some humility and the ability to celebrate one another right. because I, I would really tell you some people would think that some people would disagree with us like adamantly on some stuff. But for the most part, it's like, we all actually really, we all actually very much believe the same thing. There's some words, language is off. Sometimes it throws people off the, the prophetic, even the prophetic. Yeah. I'm like, when you really go, I'm like, I actually think you think, I actually really believe that like, they're like, well, God's speaking to me and me speaking for God, something he told me. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm like, I actually think you think God speaks to you too. Like you actually believe God speaks to you. 
Yeah, like yeah. there's a, and whatever language you use of like, oh, I just felt a moving in my heart or I just sensed right. God in this or whatever else. I'm like, okay, well, the, the word prophetic is throwing you off right, and right, maybe yeah. whatever, but we believe God speaks to us. Obviously the written word is the final authority. We submit our lives to the written word uh, uh, that God's speaking to us in a still small voice or through dream. It, ca it can't contradict the word. Right. But to say that God doesn't speak to me outside of the word, that's not accurate. Like he walks with me, he talks with me, he right. prompts me, he, you know, and I think yeah, people yeah. believe that they just get hung up on a word. That is so, because I, even my non, very non charismatic friends, they still have language of God speaking to me, you know, of course. sometimes they always qual qualify it. Well, you know, it's not an audible. I'm like, well, I know it's, you know, <laughs> but it's, it's a, yeah, a movement of sense, a spirit working in you. And yeah, I think some of this can be semantics. I, I so, want to go back to something you, oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, no. So that, that's it right there. I was just saying, yeah, just that, that, that I think a lot of people agree with us and it's just, we, we all have a very similar theology and sometimes, yeah. and this is going to maybe throw people off a little bit, but Sometimes, too, we're called to emphasize different things. And they're not contradictory or they're not. But, but, you know, I remember, Bill, one time we were in a meeting. And this might help people as well understand our environment. What, to understand the school of ministry is to help understand our environment, the zeal there. But to also understand that one time a pastor, we had a great uh, um, a denomination that uh, isn't anti-charismatic but isn't fully, you know, isn't like us. And we were in a leader's, a pastor's gathering with him. And I was with Bill and pastor raised his hand and he said, he wasn't being antagonistic or belligerent. It was honest. He said, hey, there's more to the kingdom than signs and wonders. And Bill said, oh, I, I he goes, I absolutely believe that. You know, this, this, there's, there's more to the kingdom than signs and wonders. He said, but he said, he said, we feel called to something. When a body is deficient in a mineral, mm -hmm. So if the body's deficient in vitamin D, you overemphasize vitamin D until the body becomes sufficient in it. Wow. And so, so he said, we, we, we are overemphasizing some areas because one of our mandates is, is to raise the mineral level in the body of Christ. Well, you can go across the board with IHOP and prayer movement or whatever else. Like they are very overemphasizing this one area and they very, they've raised the water level in my life of I, I may not sell everything and become a prayer missionary, but my, but my life of prayer has, been, has risen because of their emphasis. And so sometimes, too, I think people, it's not a theological issue. It's an emphasis issue they run into. That they're like, uh, and I'm like, we actually agree with the same thing. We just are emphasizing something stronger than you are. You're called to emphasize small groups. Well, I'm just making that up. You know, you're called to emphasize whatever. All of it is biblically based. All of it comes from a deep care for scripture, mm -hmm. like a deep care for scripture. Yeah. And our default mode, and again, I think it's, and this is also my concern with the younger generation sometimes, is the default mode is not, what does the word God say about this? Yeah. So then in the charismatic world, the way we get in trouble is, is, is we are more, we, we're okay with feelings, you know, at some level. We're like, feelings are all right. You know, you can express yourself and worship extravagantly and all that type of yeah. stuff. But if you get a generation that is not firmly founded in the word that says, what does the word of God say about this? Then all of a sudden it's kind of just feelings based. Yeah. And that. Yeah. So. That's the, you're blowing apart stereotypes, man. <laughs> <laughs> with the charismatic leader who doesn't, you know, just kind of quotes a verse here and there, but is really into, yeah. you know, whatever weird thing the spirit's doing today. And that, that's, you know, just in a, in a few times we've hung out. Oh, by the way, your, uh, the Jesus culture hat that you gave, that you gave out at Axiom yes. years ago was yeah. hands down my favorite hat. My kids thought I was cool again. <laughs> I was on a boat on the Great Barrier Reef going out to uh, a little island to go snorkeling. And for yeah. some stupid reason, I had my hat on, blew right off. So you've got Jesus Culture product on the Great Barrier Reef causing, causing damage on the Great Barrier oh, Reef. I need to thank you very much for that. <laughs> Fish are dying because of our hat. But that, you know, I remember just the few times you've hung out, I instantly, two things came to mind. I said, well, three things. One, I know, you know, Jesus culture, big charismatic thing, Bethel yeah. or whatever. And I'm not, I'm not, you know, uh, turned off by that. I'm like, this guy is super normal. <laughs> I've, I've been around some charismatics. I'm like, 
you just got a weird dude. Like, I, I don't want my friends to meet you because they're going to be like, is that Christianity? <laughs> I'm like, this yeah. guy's super normal down to earth. He's absolutely incredibly intelligent. The last conversation at the table at Axiom yeah. and stuff and just seeing you talk and push back in a gracious way. I'm like, man, this guy's thoughtful. And three, excessively biblical. Yeah. It's amazing, dude. That's like, <laughs> but a lot yeah. of people would kind of assume with the brand or even maybe a bad experience with charismatic Christianity that like, like, so why is that? Why is that? It wasn't really shocking to me, but I mean, some people would be like, whoa, like he doesn't fit the mold. Like wh why, it, why can't somebody have a charismatic kind of bent or, or you know, a brand of Christianity, but also be intelligent to, to be normal, to love the word of God and go where the word of God leads. Yeah. I mean, that's and, and you can, and, and I'll say this. I mean, we're kind of laying bare some care, you know, my charismatic roots and I, and I have a deep love for, for, my people, I really do. But my people um, sometimes attract weird because it, it kind of can fit there. Right. You know what I'm saying? They don't, <laughs> they don't stand out as much. Right. But also sometimes, and I say this with real love, I, I'm a pastor. I love people. Yeah. And I love all different types of people. I don't need you to be hipster. I don't need you to be cool. I don't, you know, like I just love people. I love, I, I love the different personalities of people. So you have to hear me when I say this, it's full of love, but sometimes charismatics have socially unaware people as well. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the weird part isn't even a theology thing. It's just a socially unaware person. I'm around people sometimes. And this is a silly example. And if you're not in our world, you won't get this, but, but, there's like, um, you wouldn't run into this in our church, but in many of the charismatic renewal circles, there's uh, people waving flags during oh, yeah. worship, you know? So great, you know? Well, nobody, it was just people want to express their worship through waving a flag. I'm like, I'm fine with that, you know? I, I don't, it's not, and it's not unbiblical for you to wave a flag in worship. What do I care? So anyways, but, but anyways, but then I've been like, in like a, a, the example I use is I'll be like in a lobby, just having a conversation with somebody. And then somebody wants to come and wave the flag over me, you know? And it's like, in that moment, it's like, okay, this isn't a theology issue. It's just a socially unaware individual. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, it's just something that needs to be pastored right. that goes, Hey bro, listen, it's not really the right time to come wave a flag over my head when I'm talking to somebody. That's just weird. Yeah. Like, how do that? And it's not even that I'm opposed to flags. It's not even right. that I'm opposed right. to you expressing your worship extravagantly to God, but like, yeah. you unaware of, like, you know, and sometimes it is that thing. Like, I don't know if you know Sean Bowles. No. I would encourage people to go. Sean Bowles has a book called Translating God. So he would be, a, he would, we would call him a prophet, mm -hmm. and he operates in the word of knowledge at a level that is unreal it's I, guys i've been with him i know him deeply he's been with us he is calling out people's names and addresses and middle names and kids names and it's really crazy right it's this it's a really high level word of knowledge a lot of the people that i've known that are like him in the past are really good men and women they're really godly people but they're hard to relate to they're like so kind of spiritual and they're so kind of like there that i i wouldn't sit down and have a conversation about a football game with you. You know what I'm saying? Cause I don't quite know how to relate to you. And then Sean Bowles comes along, loves people, operates in a very high level prophetic gifting. And he's full on like, I can't wait for the next Avengers movie. <laughs> yeah. And I'm play a video game. And I'm like, wow, look at you. Like, yeah. like you're real and you're relatable and you're authentic. And yet you still operate at a high level in the things of the spirit. And I, I, I think that, I think that it's totally possible. Yeah. And again, I don't ever want to talk bad about people. Even the people that wave a flag over me, these are people that love God. Sure. They, you know, they, they've got a passion for Jesus. They're just a little bit socially unaware sometimes yeah. and they meet community to go, Hey, yeah. like there's some boundaries around some yeah. stuff. Yeah. And it, it, just to go back to my other point, there's a lot of, weirdness and non-charismatic conservative baptist too. oh totally <laughs> you know? yeah totally I remember, being, just... I remember being at a conference and like uh this is so long ago the guy's probably not even live anymore but i remember uh there was like a q and a time and uh usually people ask questions right you know <laughs> like q and a time and he would stand up and it's like he wore, wore you know suit and tie and thus saith the lord he'd read a verse and stand up and sit down you know and like all right, yeah, I like yeah. you know John yeah, five totally. twenty two, but like, what? What is just is this? 
is that like it was kind of looking around like what was that all about you know and and i love the word of god like i thanks for reading the verse it was just kind of like what was that you know so but we can't and we can't define a whole movement right by some of them maybe yeah yeah and and i I would say this as well i think very much and this would be something that bill taught us in the early days is one it's messy but two you don't always know what's a wheat and a tear until you let it grow. Mm. And so it's, it's very interesting that sometimes we're, we're like, we want to, we want to look at seeds and define what they are. Mm-hmm. And they're like, I don't know what that seed is yet. I got to see it grow. Wow. And if it grows and it's got a deeper love for Jesus and it, and, and it's marriage is healthier. It's got a love for the word of God, yeah. you know, that I'm like, okay, like we can judge some trees by fruit. The right. Bible lets us do this, but, but we don't even let it get to fruit. We're like, I don't like that seed. I don't like, and listen, maybe it is a tear. Right. And see, and listen, wheat and tear grow side by side. Yeah. So I don't want to define a whole movement by some right. tears in the middle of it. Right. And I also don't what movement can stand if we did that, right? No, and I also don't want to define something just in seed form. That's the other thing sometimes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think we want to look at an acorn and go, nope, that's not an oak tree. I'm like, well, just give it some time. Like you just gotta give it some time. Like it's a seed right now. And we wanna we wanna like judge things in seed form. We wanna judge things before we've allowed some things to grow. And and so sometimes, you know, and so yeah, you're right. I I don't um, there, there are some people that have had, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to, this is going to, uh, oh, you don't, don't have to, you don't have to, you don't have to. Talk I'm just saying that. some people have said some really horrible things about us, mm-hmm. like really horrible things about us. Hmm. So, uh, uh, anyways, they said some horrible things about us and I'm like, I don't want to define a whole group of people by one person saying something about me. Yeah. Like I don't, you know, I like, like. It just doesn't make sense to me to do that. And there are really good people that are just doing the best they can and loving Jesus and yeah. being faithful to the word. So anyways, well, I don't, Manny, I don't we're gonna, be dramatic yeah. and it's not about us. I'm just saying I don't want to define or judge entire things by one or two people yeah. that, I, that say something about me online. Man, Ben, I just want to thank you so much for your amazing heart for – all these things heart for jesus and uh with with all the criticism as i know it can be tough but man the lives that and that you have touched let me just say the spirit of god through your however you yeah absolutely i'm with you yeah and your team and all the people around you but man the last 20 years and and what so let's just say the the jesus culture movement has done has has touched a lot of lives and has brought a lot of people to jesus so that's amazing before we go i want to mention a couple of your books uh you wrote a book called jesus culture um, your latest book is Rooted. I, the, I got the subtitle here, the, the Hidden Places Where God Develops You. Can you just briefly yeah. talk about that book? That subtitle is so intriguing. Um, yeah, I take, this, I take just that early life of David and try to really encourage people that um, when God plants a seed in your life, a word, a vision, a dream, a desire, whatever it is, when God plants a seed in your life, the next step is not fruit. The next step is roots. And a lot of people get tripped up and are very frustrated in their walk with God because they don't have any context or clarity for how he works. So God doesn't start right away building, developing fruit in your life. He develops roots in your life. And, and roots are, they're below the surface. They're hidden. They're messy. They're not linear. But when people go like, again, one of the things we say is God's not interested in developing your vision. God's interested in developing you. Because when, you, when he develops your life, your vision is just a natural outflow of a, of a developed, healthy you. So, and God can develop you anywhere. He can develop you in a cubicle. He can develop you wherever he wants to develop you. So trying to really give people vision for that when God plants something, it's a process that begins. So the life of David, when Samuel came to him, he was preteen. It was almost 20 years later when he was 30 that he stepped into that thing. And, and, and God took those almost two decades to develop him so that he could step into what he'd called him to. And, and, and I talk about, so we talk about the process that God has us in. We've lost the concept of a process because we're no longer an agricultural age. So we're like so frustrated when things aren't happening. 
when the reality is, is you plant a seed, it's seven years later you get fruit. Some nut trees are 20 years later. Mm-hmm. So, so um, you get that thing. And then what we walk through is this, is that, that God developed David in three soils. The field, so intimacy, you know, uh, priorities. He developed him serving, really learning that soil of serving, serving a, a bad king, serving. So, so the soil of intimacy, the soil of serving, and then the cave, which is community. He stuck him in a cave with a bunch of messed up people and said, figure out community. And so it's those things that God is developing your life in those three soils and just really giving people vision. My dog's barking in the back. <laughs> no, I'm like, my dog is asking to be let out. I'm at home. So must be, must be time time to wrap go, up. Dude, this has been seriously so incredibly helpful. I'm going to be processing a lot of this. I'm sure I, I know this is going to be super helpful for a lot of my listeners. I'll probably get some emails that I might forward you. <laughs> um, no, I, no, only good ones. No, only I, good ones. So the, my, I, I don't know what it is, but the people that listen to this podcast, they're the most amazing. They're, yeah. I, don't, I literally don't get any, any, I get tons of criticism elsewhere. I podcast yeah, they're hungry. all gratitude and they love just honest conversations yeah, and all across totally. the map and they just want to they don't need everybody to agree with them or me to yeah. or them agree with me they just they, they want to think out loud with with tough topics so this is going to be just really really helpful um, yeah thanks so much for being on the show uh, thanks thanks for having me on and thanks for jumping into these topics it's always good and, and i i mean so i'm not just saying this but so have appreciated the work that you're doing so grateful for what you're leading in we've sent our team to be with you i've sat uh, with you times every time i go away feeling stronger better our team has been more enriched so my dog is barking uh, telling me the podcast that. needs to be over <laughs> all right i'm gonna sign out man thanks so much for being on the show and uh, thanks for watching or listening to theology in a raw we'll see you next time